All right, so I'm going to have to improvise a little bit. I did not realize that I would be giving this presentation with my laptop atop some type of Soviet-era uh, box. So this is a very exciting start to everything. So hello, everyone. So my name is James. I am a professor at Harvard. And today, I'm going to discuss dreams and why they fail. We're going to be going to the left in this talk. We're going to the left. Okay, I want to be clear about that. There's not going to be a puppet show. There's not going to be a door prize. There's just going to be more left. Okay, so I want to be honest about that. I realize that from your perspective, I'm motioning right. That's okay. This is all part of the theater. Suspend the disbelief, okay? So let me give you my standard disclaimer, however. The opinions that I express in this talk are my own. I represent no one else but myself and, of course, little Gary Martinez. I met Gary at the airport. His flight had been delayed by 37 hours. Tears were streaming down his little Gary Martinez face. I said, what can I do, little man? to make it better. And he said, as he wiped off the tears, I want you to give a sarcastic talk about technology. <laughs> and I said, Gary, I can do that for you. I can do that for you. So let's dedicate this talk to poor little Gary Martinez, whose flight has now been delayed for an unprecedented 73 hours. So in my opinion, the biggest challenge of system administration is that it's very difficult to explain your life to other people who don't administer machines. I mean, if you're a firefighter or a beekeeper or a poet, your life has rules and concrete goals. You want to put out the fire. You don't want to get eaten by bees. You want to make all the words at the end of your sentences rhyme because that's what a poem is, right? So they're very simple things, right? But when you do system administration, it's like a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie from the 80s. The only rule is that there are no rules, right? And so. That's a problem because when we wake up in the morning, we know that we're just going to be assaulted by an uncaring universe. We know that any computational device can be ruined. And so you might be thinking, even an abacus? And the answer is yes, you can foobar an abacus, OK? <laughs> These are the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And if you're not living in this world, it can be very difficult to understand what's going on in that world. So for example, if you're a assisted man, you spend a lot of time looking at log files and outputs and things like this, trying to figure out why things are broken. So like you wake up one day, and you just want to install a package on your machine. It seems like a very reasonable thing to ask. So you fire up your command shell, you type RPM build, then what happens? Oh my god, OK. So fortify source requires a link. There's an underscore personality here. There's a bogus date in the build error. And the email addresses are Andre the Giant, <laughs> Bill Clinton, and Gumby. Is this some type of international conspiracy? What's, what's going on here? When you read a log message like this, this is almost like getting a drunk text message from a college student, right? where it's only composed of emojis. I mean, essentially, this message could not have been more useless if it had just said, football, <laughs> werewolf, palm tree, palm tree, palm tree, <laughs> right? That's the exact same amount of information content that was actually contained in the rear error message. Right? But how can you explain this tragedy to someone who is not deeply steeped in our culture? It's a big problem. But of course, we are forced to do this whenever one of our coworkers stops by our little cubicle. So for example, you'll be working hard. right? You'll be in the matrix. And then your office mate Todd will come by. And he'll say, hey, I just got back from Machu Picchu. Do you want to see a picture? And he's actually showing you the picture at the same time he's asking if you want to see the picture. Okay, so this picture is now part of your life narrative now. It's in your quilt, it's not getting out of there, right? And so you look at this picture and you think, I have seen this picture 27 million times. Okay, stop pretending that you discovered Machu Picchu. You did not discover it. It was there. It's been discovered many, many years ago. What I want to do now, if I don't want to draw this picture from memory, which I could clearly do, is I want to go to Machu Picchu, then I want to burn it down. <laughs> because nobody has that picture, actually. That would be an original picture of Machu Picchu. But of course, we cannot do this type of thing because society frowns upon vigilante justice. So you just sit there and wait for Todd to admit his 20-minute story about things that everyone else in the whole world has done. And then at some point, Todd will say, well, what are you working on? 
And most of the time you're able to contain the anger, but sometimes you just flip out. You just say, listen, Todd, I live in a world of blood and fire that you will never understand, okay? <laughs> Every day in my life is a battle against hieroglyphics that have the power to create and destroy, okay? Do you know what this character is called? That character is called A. Do you know what that character is called? That character is called Ding, okay? <laughs> And that character is called a single backslash that's made of two backslashes. And do you know what that character is called? That character is called, I don't like the current character. I need to go back one character so I can figure out what to do next with all these characters that are in my life. Okay? I live in a world filled with cryptic runes that you could never understand. Okay, all of my numbers have X's in them. Every single one, it's like a little bunch of Confederate flags staring me in the face. I know that you say it's about hex rights. It's not about the Civil War. Stop reading those textbooks from Texas. This is the world that I live in, okay? What do you have to say about that, Todd? And Todd says, palm tree, palm tree, palm tree. So anyway, so I guess the point of that story is that uh, technology can make people get into arguments, I guess. Uh, so this seems like a pretty generalizable lesson, at least in my life. Uh, so I get into arguments about startups all the time. So some of these startups that are coming out of the Bay Area are really pretty mind-blowing. You've got startups to get your groceries for you. You've got startups to cook a meal for you. And let me be clear, there has never been a better time to be someone who hates doing laundry. Okay, this is a renaissance for you, okay? You've got Laundry Locker, you've got Rinse, you've got Sudsy, you've got InstaWash, you've got SF Wash, you've got Washio. I mean, look at all these opportunities to keep your hands baby soft, okay? It's quite amazing, right? And I mean, recently there are these startups, people can't even tell if they're real or not. Like a startup that will take trash from your curb to a few feet away from where your curb is, right? This is actually a plausible thing that could get money from the VC community. So I mean, if you look at this list of services, what would you think? If you knew nothing about San Francisco, you would think that San Francisco is inhabited by a race of humans who only have heads. Nobody has hands or legs or any appendages to interact with the material universe. These people are so helpless. They're basically like Charlie Brown characters, but without the bodies, okay? They're just Charlie Brown heads, okay? Little footballs inside of baby cribs, just really trying to consume resources as quickly as possible, okay? That's basically my model for what's going on in San Francisco right now. Now, that's right, I'm not wrong. I mean, it's almost like a science fiction movie. We have these very well-intentioned, but deeply confused Charlie Brown heads trying to create a society which ostensibly is better for everyone, but actually only helps the Charlie Brown heads, right? So it seems like there's perhaps something wrong here. Now, fundamentally speaking, one thing that's kind of weird about a lot of these services is that they're basically built around this model of creating a new type of poor person whose value is defined purely by the strange whims of these techno-aristocrat Charlie Brown heads. Like in two years from now, quote me on this, you're going to be hearing startup pitches like this, okay? I have a new startup, it's called Toothy, okay? Here's the idea. There's a lot of rich people who want more teeth in their mouth. There are a lot of poor people over here who've got some teeth. Now, using advanced machine learning, we decide which rich people should take which teeth from the poor people. Now, probably the answer is going to be all the teeth, OK? <laughs> it's probably going to be all the teeth. So all the teeth go over here. Now, in exchange for giving up the teeth, the poor person's going to get like $5, OK? And that's not per tooth, OK? That's for all the teeth. Okay, so you give away all your teeth, you get $5, you can go get some ice cream, you can buy half of a movie ticket, you can do anything that your imagined desires as long as it fits inside a $5 sized box. Okay, so that's what's going on there. So anyway, so people get excited about all these different startups, right? And so another technology that people get excited about are these, these dating apps for smartphones. Now every day I read about some new dating app that allows you to connect with people in your Facebook network or connect with people who you walked by on the street or connect with random people who probably have cold sores, right? I don't make the news, okay? I just report it, get some Valtrex, clear that right up, okay? 
But the thing is that people get excited about these dating apps, like in the same way that we got excited about pizza parties when we were a kid, right? So you remember we were kids, we were running around on the playground, setting things on fire, throwing rocks at each other. There's cannibalism. Judy had her growth spurt early, so she's just stomping the life out of people. You know, it was just amazing. Everybody's having a great time. Then the teacher came out, and he said, everyone calm down. It's time to go back to class. And you're like, whatever, old man. We're not going to do it. And then you kidnap him and hold him for ransom, then get the money, and then sell him to pirates anyway just to mess with his family's head or something like this. So anyway, so you're running around like a wild person. And the only thing that the teacher could do to calm you down was to say, kids, if you behave, you can have a pizza party tomorrow. And you turn to everyone and say, there's a pizza party at stake. It's time to get serious. Everyone shut it down. Okay, Julie, stop poisoning the water supply. Ronald, stop trying to convert Thomas to be a Scientologist, maybe tomorrow. Okay, there's a pizza party on the line. I'll come down there. I'll smack you in the mouth. I'm five years old. I talk like this. This is a pizza party. It's a game changer. Okay, it's a game changer. So this is what I feel like when I read some of these press releases for these dating apps. People say it's gonna revolutionize how we go out and how we meet people. But I always wonder, were people not dating before dating apps were invented? Like literally, how did everyone in this room get here? If people were not meeting people and then doing people things. Right? It just, did dating apps somehow invent dating, then go backwards in time to create the human race? It's just very strange. I don't get it. So these dating apps, they are entertaining, they are fun, but it's not like human beings were on a trend line for extinction before Tinder came along. Right? We were actually doing okay. I mean, the people who think that dating apps are revolutionary are similar to the people who think that Myers-Briggs tests are sort of like an unprecedented way to expose our personalities to other people, right? Like before Myers-Briggs came along, two people in the medieval era would meet, and one of them would be shy, but that person couldn't say that they were an INTP. And then both people would just agree to collapse to the ground and die, because <laughs> there was no way to bridge the chasm that separated their two souls. It's just, they couldn't do anything. Now, of course, this is ludicrous. Right? In fact, the same people who think that Myers-Briggs stuff is cool are the same people who think it's reasonable to brag at a party. Yeah, I do some DJing on the weekends. I don't care that you're an Intifapa JJ DJ. I don't care, okay? Just because you have a playlist doesn't mean that you're a DJ, okay? That's like saying you have some Legos, now you're Leonardo da Vinci making inventions in your dream laboratory, okay? So you need to be serious about yourself. That's what I'm saying. Be serious. Anyways, I am digressing. I have digressed myself. My original point was that the online dating scene is absolutely ridiculous. But the thing is, if you're single, you got to be in that scene, right? Because you're at home, you're alone, it's a Saturday night, but you know that people are swiping, they're clicking, they're checking, they're unchecking. Okay, and if you're not part of that scene, this is what romance looks like these days. You're gonna get left behind, okay? But what's so funny is that you get on these apps, right? Because everyone says, hey, you gotta get in this scene. But anyone who is in the scene will tell you, this is not the best scene. You know, you're constantly checking your phone all the time, trying to figure out how to trick a stranger into thinking that you're a reasonable person. And your friends will ask about you, like how's the online dating going? And you're like, yeah, I'm, do I'm doing okay. You know, I, I mean, like, I knew that online dating would, like, have some ups and downs. But, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's fine. But, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. But you look at those eyes. <laughs> you look at those haunting Britney Spears eyes. And you know that it's not fine, okay? But this is what you have to do these days if you are single. So that's me. I'm in the scene, okay? That's why I have a rose so that you can know I'm out there. I'm available to be loved. I'm available to be cherished. Let me tell you, okay? I'm a rare desert flower waiting for someone to pour water on my roots so I can grow like a delicate beauty. I'm like a baby bird with a broken wing. Okay, just take me into your life and nurse me back to health, right? I'll sing you a song of romance and sunsets that never end. I mean, hand in hand, we're gonna walk along the beach. I'll show you those hidden places, those gardens of delight that only lovers know. Now, of course, I say precisely none of this in my profile, right? Because nobody wants to read this kind of uh, poetry on these profiles, right? People only wanna see your pictures. 
So why is that? The reason is that the number one fear of internet dating is that you will somehow be tricked into a first date with a goblin, okay? <laughs> Everybody's worried about a goblin date. So your number one job as you are constructing an online profile is to convince people that you are not a goblin. However, this is tricky because the universe only contains three good photos of you, okay? Everyone here knows that. And the thing is, we all know exactly which three photos those are, right? Now, of course, there's the problem because some of these online dating apps actually require more than three photos, right? So this leads to a phenomenon that everyone who has done, done online dating is well aware of. It's like, for example, someone will be looking at my profile and they'll say, yeah, that looks good. Mm hmm I like what I see there. Ah, uh, looks like you've been working out. Cool. Jesus Christ, it's Krampus. It is the German demon who punishes naughty children at Christmas. That is, that is unfortunate, right? And what's unfortunate about this is that that's actually what I look like, right? Like that, that is my steady state. Like those other photos I was showing of you, uh, that I, uh, the pictures of me, like those great photos, those things were acts of God. Okay, everything was coming together, the light was perfect, my skin was clean, I wasn't sweaty, it was just all the puzzle pieces were fitting together so perfectly. But like this photo up here, that's me like 97% of the time, right? And that's actually okay, I think, because I think that most dudes look like this, but this is why I find it so funny when like a dude is talking about a woman and he says, oh, well, she's only like a seven out of 10, and it's like, hey bro, you're a Krampus, okay? <laughs> You're a Krampus. Even if I accept the validity of your ranking scale, like she's a seven out of 10, you're a weird demon who licks German children. So like maybe you should stop talking so much about things that will never happen to you. You know, so anyways, that's just me. So as I was saying, I digress frequently. My point is that I was talking about online dating. And so if you go out there and you do the online dating, you will actually get like a bunch of crazy experiences. So here's an experience that happens to me all the time. So I'll get an email from the dating app and it's gonna say, hey, I found a great match for you. So I'll go on the app and take a look at the profile that I'm matched with. And let's say her name is Julia. I'll look at her interests. She's got all of my interests, hockey fights, year-round Christmas trees. And then I'll look at her profile text and it'll be funny and charming. She's not a manic pixie dream girl, but she wants me to help her build a time machine out of blankets. That's, that's great, that's what I've been looking for. And then I'll, I'll look at the part of her profile that's titled, you know, who she's looking for. It'll say brown eyes and I have brown eyes and she's looking for someone who's five foot eight. I'm exactly five foot eight. And she's looking for a man with an athletic build, a slender build or a golem build. I'm one of those three. <laughs> My luck is looking up. She wants a man who's interested in science fiction movies. Guess what? I love science fiction movies. At this point, it seems like Julia and I are the perfect match. Let's just see the last thing that she wants her man to be. Ethnicity, son of a! <laughs> I got so close. What is up with this whites only stuff? She's like a water fountain from the 1950s. <laughs> And why is this information at the bottom of the profile instead of the top of the profile? Why do I have to scroll through this whole thing only to discover at the end that Julia is somehow allergic to black people? This is ridiculous. And by the way, is this the advanced machine learning I keep reading so much about in Wired Magazine? Somehow the cloud is thinking like, oh yeah, James is a black guy. Let's match him up with a clan wizard. That sounds like a great idea. Anyways, this is the scene, okay? This is the scene that everybody talks about, okay? The only thing worse than this is when I go to the acceptable ethnicity section and I see a bunch of stuff and I'm like, oh, this is so great, it's a huge list. It's like, okay, Filipino, that's great. Hispanic, that's fantastic. You know, Papua New Guinean from the western half of the country. We need more of those people. In defile. Is in defile an ethnicity that you've ever heard of? Indefile American, is this a millennial thing? I never heard this kind of thing. Like instead of just having this long list there, what they should do is just put a picture of me with the Ghostbuster sign through it, okay? That would just make it clear to me, not that guy, 
okay? If you were that guy, then perhaps Clan Wizard Julia is not the one for you. So anyways, large installation system administration. It's uh, what I've been talking about today, so I hope that was clear. Uh, one thing that I don't like about large uh, system administration is uh, backing up my data. I know that there's a lot of commercial stuff out there. I can put my, my data on the cloud and try to automate the whole process. But here's, here's the problem, right? Tools like GitHub and Bitbucket, I feel like they're, they're too impersonal, right? They don't really understand the emotional relationships that I have with my data. And that's why my primary backup solution is emailing myself thursday.tar.gz, okay? This is a multi-megabyte email attachment that contains some random stuff that may or may not be useful to me in the future, okay? Now the advantage of thursday.tar.gz is that I know exactly what's in there. It's my Thursday stuff. <laughs> this is the kind of personalized touch that I demand for my backup solution. Now I know that a lot of you, they like, you know, subversion, you like mercurial stuff like that, but it's not for me, right? Here's what is for me, okay? Being in a cold, lonely place as I try to figure out the distinction between code kinda works.zip and code sorta works.zip, okay? That's how champions spend their time, okay? Who's got all this time and effort for code diffing and source code repositories? We don't use code diffing for anything else that we love. You know, we don't take pictures of our children and say, here's what Kevin looks like at one year old, here's what he looks like at 25, right? Don't do that, don't diff Kevin. Email yourself multiple copies of Kevin just so you can be sure. This is the strategy that seems to make sense to me. But I get it, you're a very modern audience, okay? So you don't want to email stuff to yourself. So I guess that means we'll have to use something like Git to back up all our data. Now, Git can be very nice, don't get me wrong. But to be clear, Git is like that friend of yours who every once in a while goes a little bit too crazy at the party, okay? So when everything is going well, Git is awesome. But when Git goes bad, Git goes bad immediately, okay? <laughs> and it goes bad hard. Okay, and it takes you to a very, very dark place. Okay, so to understand why, let me show you a high level picture of how Git works. Yeah? Does that all make sense? Did you see how all those simple concepts came together to form a cohesive whole? Well, if that didn't make sense, pray tell, then look at it like this. Git is basically a confusing movie about time travel and parallel dimensions, and then you have to put your source code in that movie. So Git essentially provides Donnie Darko as a service. Git is a tool which allows different people to confuse each other across time and space, right? Now at a high level, each developer in Git is like a character in the movie, and each character is working on a local view of what they think the movie universe looks like. And when each person stays in their own universe, Git is glorious, okay? But then when people start trying to send objects across universes, it becomes just a debacle, just a horrible nightmare. And the only way that you can fix your code is to utter these arcane Git commands that were last chanted by druids trying to summon Baphomet from Stonehenge, right? Now, if you've ever tried to fix a broken Git repo, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So you're sitting at your computer, you're just minding your own business, and then your cell phone makes that little noise, right? Hooray, someone in the universe loves you. So you check your cell phone, you got an email message there, and you realize, hey there, it's from Git. So the message says that your coworker, Anthony, has pushed some changes to the repo. That's good, that's why we brought Anthony in. So you go to your own version of the repo, you start trying to pull stuff in, all of a sudden Git says, automatic merge failed. Fix the conflict. And at this point, everyone in your organization is thinking, did the Git repo just break? Oh my God. Did the Git repo, what just happened, right? And you're just very, very still when this happens. I mean, literally this is the deer in the headlights phenomenon. You just, you just if you can just stay perfectly still, maybe time will go backwards and you can throw your cell phone out the window before it told you that Anthony has ruined everything. 
Uh, but it's too late, of course. You did the pull, you tried the merge, or did you? Who really knows? If you've ever used git from the command line, it just tells you this stuff and drops the mic and it leaves. I mean, who knows what's happening? So maybe you didn't do the pull, maybe you pulled someone else's code. I, it's hard to say, but you're just very still. You're very still, you worry that you've broken the repo, and you basically think, I could just move to Canada. Nobody would ever find me. I would learn how to speak Canadian. I would eat their food. I would live as they live. I'd, I'd get a wolf. I would compete in lumberjack games. I just, I gotta get out of this city. It wasn't working for me anyways. This Git repo is just the latest sign that I gotta change. Something, it's like a Bruce Springsteen song. Something's gotta change, you know? Then you hear your cell phone make another little noise and you look at it and so help you God, Anthony's pushed another commit. This guy is stomping over your code like Godzilla stomping over Tokyo, okay? And you feel bad for the repo. It's like when Khan put that space worm in the Chekhov's ear, and you're like, anyone but Chekhov, he's so cuddly and friendly. Why would you do that? And your cell phone keeps making these little noises, and you know who it is. It's Anthony releasing commit after commit a waterfall of merge conflicts. And now you're angry, you're sad, you're all of Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, and there's a new stage called vengeance. <laughs> but what do you do? What do you do? You're alone in this world. It's all existential philosophy at this point. I mean, you've been abandoned by the universe. How are you gonna get that code back? So, you do the only thing that you can do. You call up your friend who's the Git master. So you say, hi, I need some help with my uh, Git repo. I hear that your code's been taken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally Anthony's fault. He keeps on pushing these commits. Let me tell you exactly what you need to do. You're a little abrupt. I feel like maybe you should smile a little bit more. Do you want your code back? That's, he's from marketing. He has nothing to do with this. Stop choking him out. This is a little over the top. Yes, I want my code back. Please tell me what to do. Okay, this is exactly what you have to do. Go to the local market. You'll find an Iranian man playing guitar with no strings. <laughs> Record the sound of the music that he's playing. Well, I mean, like, the guitar doesn't actually have any strings. So there's not any music per se. Do you want your code back? Yes, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Okay, excellent. Record the sound of the music using the following command, git dash dash Iranian musician single dash rebase ampersand guitar with no strings dash branch equals Higgs boson date equals opposite date did you hit enter yeah I hit enter that was a mistake I hadn't finished giving you the command you need to finish it by typing checkout, check-in, hashtag for real. The master's tools will never destroy the master's house. So sh should I hit enter now? Do you want your code back? Stop asking me if I, yes. Assume that I want my code back. Then hit enter now. So you do what the guru says, and you eventually manage to restore the repo to a good state. Now the next thing that you need to do is obvious. You gotta go find Anthony, right? So you go to Anthony's office, and you see Anthony is just straight up chilling. Anthony is having a great old time drinking from his juice box, listening to whatever stupid music Anthony likes to listen to. So you go, hey, Anthony, yeah, how, how's it going, man? And so Anthony says, great, because if you're an idiot like Anthony, things are always great. Right? This world is filled with beauty. You've got a juice box. You're writing thousands of lines of code that unbeknownst to you are stomping on other people's commits like Bigfoot. It couldn't be better, right, from the perspective of Anthony. So you say to Anthony, hey, you know that commit blizzard that you just generated? That storm of the century took me seven hours to fix. I had to call Liam Neeson, who I know personally and who helps me with things, and there was an Iranian guitarist. It was very confusing. Okay, you've wasted seven hours of my life. Didn't I tell you multiple times which files I was working on so this kind of thing wouldn't happen? And Anthony says, and I quote, yeah, I just wanted to try something out. <laughs> when I hear that phrase, yeah, I just wanted to try something out, I want to take myself and I want to fold myself into a paper airplane 
And I want to fly far, far away from this world. Okay, to that place where the elves go with the end of Lord of the Rings, right? I don't want to be a part of this society anymore. Right, you want to try something out. My code base is not a theater for your performance art, okay? You want to try some things out. Go be a mime. Go join Cirque du Soleil. Be a bendable person, okay? Don't be trying to discover things about yourself in my code base because you didn't go to Europe and find out what you were all about, right? So he basically say all this stuff to you to Anthony, he's like, yeah, it, it is crazy, right? And you're like, oh, oh, it is crazy. Oh, it's a mystery. This is like CSI. Let's work together to figure out who murdered the repo. You murdered the repo. You murdered the repo. Own it, Anthony, own it. He just says, well, I mean, it's just, it's just hard to say. It's just hard to say. As if somehow that was an answer to the implicit question, is it hard to say? Oh, it is hard to say, right? And you say, okay, Anthony, listen, here's the new rule. Okay, you've messed up the repo, so now you have a Star Wars name. Your name is Jax Debo now. You are Jax Debo, that's your name for an entire week, and you have to wear tentacles on your head because that's the alien race that you are now. Your name is Jax Debo. And he looks at you and he's like, but my name is, is Anthony. And you say, there is no Anthony here. You killed Anthony, okay? You are Jax Debo. You are a dancer for the Hutt family. You come from the planet Ryloth where nobody follows best practices for git commits. What do you think about that, Jax Debo? And Jax Debo just takes a sip of his juice from that juice box and he says, I guess I'm a dancer then. And at this point, you wish that somebody would come and just take him away. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.